Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 29th, 2015, and my guest is Jesse Ausubel, Director of the Program for the Human Environment and Senior Research Associate at the Rockefeller University. Jesse, welcome to Econ Talk. Russ, it's a pleasure to be with you and your listeners. Our topic for today is the interaction between technology and the environment and nature, and we're going to focus on a fascinating essay you published in the Breakthrough Journal, the title of that essay, The Return of Nature, How Technology Liberates the Environment. I'm going to start with agriculture, as you do there. Uh, What has been agriculture's influence on the environment in recent decades, especially when we think about corn, which is a major uh, agricultural product in the United States? Russ, when we think of high tech, we tend to think of uh, telecommunications and computers, but actually innovation in farming and agriculture continues to be very, very fast. And one of the ways we see that is that yields keep rising in the same way that uh, a, a semiconductor company may get more chips out of the same silicon wafer than it used to. Farmers are getting more corn out of uh, an acre or a hectare of land. And a lot of that is for the same reason. If you visit a modern farmer, uh, the cab of uh, her or his tractor or combine or truck uh, looks like uh, the the trading desk of uh, someone on Wall Street. There are video feeds all over the place and all kinds of information coming in. And we're we're experiencing a revolution called precision agriculture in the same way that uh, draft animals at one time uh, changed agriculture and then tractors themselves. Now, the confluence of information is leading to rising yields. Uh, People thought yields might plateau, but in fact, they keep going up. And they're going up even though we've stabilized or even reduced a bit some of the inputs like fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides and water. Uh, But weather forecasts have gotten better and we have better seeds and we know more about the plants. So farmers are growing more per area. And the result of that is they don't need as much area to grow the crops, the protein and calories that feed humanity. Uh, And when they don't need as much area, in fact, it usually means they don't need as much water as well. So corn is just an incredible case. Uh, Last year, uh, a farmer in Georgia named Brandy Dowdy grew over 500 bushels on uh, an acre. Uh, And that's, uh, you know, it's enough to feed a couple hundred people in terms of raw protein or calories for a year. It's just an astonishing achievement. And it's uh, three or four times what the average Iowa grower does and six to eight times what the average world grower does. So the headroom for improvement is still enormous in American and and world agriculture. The basic, the bottom line is we may have passed the peak use of arable land for farming. Uh, In the future, we can have more protein and calories, more crops. to feed a a somewhat larger population, but using less land and probably less water and less fertilizer and less herbicide as well. You point out, uh, you point out there's been a decoupling of uh, corn production and corn output. And it's rather extraordinary. It's not just, Oh, wow, we're getting more corn per acre. Uh, Corn acreage is, uh, is relatively flat and production has gone through the roof. That's exactly right. For a long time, up until about 1940, for almost all crops, and corn is the the most important crop in America and in some ways the the most important crop in the world in terms of tonnages, the the, the acreage advanced in tandem with the the production. So if we wanted wanted more ears of corn, we, we plowed more land, we opened up more fields. But around 1940, uh, the land used for corn stabilized or even started to shrink a bit, but the corn yields, the corn production kept going up and up and up. And uh, it's uh, gone up by a factor of four, or almost five times since 1940 with the same land. So this decoupling of uh, acreage and production uh, frees land for nature. And we're starting to see that uh, in America and worldwide. And the, you know, 
I'm a, I'm a, like many people, I'm a gardener and a small scale farmer myself. I have a couple of acres. I have 40 fruit trees and I love my cherry trees and my, my pears and peaches, which are just about to ripen. Um, but, uh, the, uh, you know, of course, agriculture is the biggest transformer of the landscape by far, much more so than cities. You know, the area that agriculture takes is, uh, five or six times the area that we, uh, use for cities. So the fact now that we can, accomplish what agriculture needs to accomplish, but on the same or less land allows us, allows nature the chance to rebound. Uh, and of course, this is all going on uh, in a time when we have mandated the use of corn for cars and, and fuel. As you point out, we feed corn to uh, people, we feed corn to animals, and we feed corn to automobiles. Uh, I was shocked to see in your chart, one of your charts, that the amount we feed to automobiles has is almost half of the total amount of corn that's grown. Uh, most of it goes to animals still. Um, it's it's surprising how little we eat. Uh, corn is – it's risen slightly, but it's basically flat for the last – it's not a very important increase. But the amount that's gone to uh, automobiles has gone up a lot. I think that was a mistake uh, per, I think that was a an environmental mistake and a, an economic mistake. If we if we didn't have that, these effects would be even would be more dramatic in terms of how much land would be freed up for other uses. Russ, that's exactly right. Only about one out of ten ears of corn is fed that we grow in America is fed directly to an American as uh, cream corn or popcorn or or uh, corn on the cob. Uh, uh, almost half of it is now being uh, turned into. Uh, liquor, I'll say, to uh, power cars, and uh, uh, a lot of it is being uh, uh, fed to animals, but mostly to cattle and some to uh, to pigs. So when you, when you see cornfields, you're really not, you know, you may think food for humans, but in fact, it's food for cars and food for animals. And if Americans uh, moderated their consumption of meat just a bit and I would say abandoned the foolishness of uh, trying to stuff uh, ears of corn into uh, into gas tanks. Uh, there would be yet more possibility for releasing uh, land for nature and allowing nature to rebound. And even beyond that, of course, about a third of the food produced in the world is wasted. Uh, doesn't go into our into our uh, onto our plates and into our stomachs. Uh, in the rich countries, of course, a lot of food is purchased and then thrown away, whether in restaurants or in homes. And in poor countries, uh, a lot of food uh, rots in the field or there's poor storage. So if we were to change our diet a little bit, uh, you know, and uh, change the way we power cars uh, and improve uh, the the waste, uh, reduce waste a bit in the food system, you know, maybe a third or a half of all the agricultural land in the world today uh, could be released again and become uh, woodlands or uh, savannas or whatever whatever might be uh, appropriate. And so the potential for uh, a rebound of nature, a return of nature over the next century is, is huge. Uh, you know, we, we may really be at the peak of the human disturbance of the landscape, the terrestrial landscape. Let's talk about the uh, animal part that you just alluded to uh, as you do in the essay. It's uh, a rather uh, another extraordinary change. What's fun about these uh, – the facts that you've gathered here is uh, these are not, again, sort of like, well, there's sort of a, a small change here. Maybe if it continues, it will have a big impact. These these are massive changes in, in human activity due to technology, typically sometimes due to changes in taste or sometimes due to government policy as, as we just had an example and went in the other direction. But – so you have a great line. You say that uh, chicken gets better mileage than pork or beef. I assume what you meant by that is the amount of corn we have to feed chickens to get a pound of, of protein. Is that a, a good summary? That's exactly right. You know, we can think of of animals, including humans in a sense, but let's just think of, uh, of uh, chickens and pigs and cattle as machines to produce meat. And if you feed uh, a steer some corn, you're getting in automotive terms, say 12 miles to the gallon. You're a pig, maybe 40 miles to the gallon, but a chicken, 60 miles to the gallon. So a chicken is like a, a Prius or a super efficient car. Uh, whereas uh, 
uh, cattle and is, uh, you know, are, from that point of view, very inefficient machines. And farmers have noticed this, of course, over the past 20, 30 years. Uh, a lot of people talk about uh, the shift in meat consumption in America elsewhere to chicken for dietary or health reasons. But a lot of it has to do with the economics as well of the producers. And uh, if you're if you're a meat grower, uh, you're getting a, a pounds of meat cheaper and quicker if you're growing uh, uh, poultry. Uh, you know, a, a broiler can be ready in 40, 45 days to go to market, whereas cattle take years. So it's not only the the, the ratio, it's not only the efficiency of the conversion, but uh, also you can realize a return quicker. You don't have to you know, have your, you don't have to pay interest, so to say, for such a long time. So the, 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 the whole meat system is itself becoming more efficient. And of course, fish, if we go to aquaculture, catfish, tilapia, and so forth, uh, they don't have to stand up like chickens. So they're even more efficient. You could say uh, a fish gets perhaps 80 miles to the gallon. So if uh, in the future, uh, the diet continues to evolve in the direction of uh, of fish and poultry, then again, we can free up a lot of land for nature. Uh, and of course, the uh, transition to chick – the not transition, but the incredible increases in chicken um, growth in terms of population and uh, consumption by Americans, part of that's being driven by the fact that as we've mandated feeding corn to cars – We've pushed up the world price, the U.S. price, and that has made the relative price of chicken uh, more attractive to beef. And that's helped push, as you said, along with the health issues, uh, it's pushed a lot of Americans to consume more chicken than they did before. Um, so part of that increase isn't just people saying, I wish we could buy a more efficient uh, form of meat. It's simply that uh, we've we've changed the relative price. And that's a – again, I wish we could come back on that a little bit uh, policy-wise, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, that's – that also has to do with the extraordinary success of soybean agriculture. Chickens are fed mainly uh, soybeans, whereas cattle are fed mainly corn. Oh, oh good, didn't know. And that. so, yeah, so the you know, and soybeans Same barely effect, existed. Even more as so. a, yeah, they barely existed as a, a, a crop uh, in uh, uh, let's say 1940. They really burst on the scene in the middle of the century. Uh, they, they were, of course, they were grown in Japan and some parts of the world for for centuries. But in the in the U.S. and Europe, they're really uh, South America. They're really new crops, and uh, uh, they've turned out to be, you know, again, they're 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 biological machines and really smart ones. They use inputs very efficiently, and uh, if one wants uh, to uh, to grow meat, then this the soybean poultry route is. Uh, is uh, really efficient. So again, one has to look at agriculture in a quite different way than I think most people do. Most people tend to think of it as somehow a backward sector, you know, brown collars. And uh, but uh, if you uh, spend a little time with uh, with uh, growers today, you you find that uh, uh, agriculture, you know, there's a really a lot of. Uh, of course, there's always been a lot of craft in it, but there's a lot of technology and science as well, and it's an extremely dynamic sector. And of course, the other part we haven't talked about is that we talked about all the, the decreases or leveling off of inputs despite the increases in output. That one of the inputs that's shrunk dramatically is human beings. Uh, agriculture as a source of, of work is dramatically down over the last 100 years from roughly 40 percent to something under 3 or 2 percent uh, in the workforce as a proportion of the workforce. And that's been a wonderful thing. It's freed up human beings to do other creative and, and productive things and, of course – we're talking mainly here about land. Uh, what about you? Didn't mention vegetarianism. Uh, if there were, well, there's been a big trend away from beef towards chicken. If there were a trend away from meat toward uh, vegetarianism, how would that affect your story about land use? Obviously, we wouldn't be feeding uh, corn to or soybeans to um, to animals, but we would be growing a lot more. Uh, soybeans, presumably, and maybe something else to uh, create uh, human protein at that point. Uh, how would that affect the use of land? Well, that would also uh, free up land, and the uh, I would, though, of course, uh, tofu and uh, soybeans are a, a very popular uh, form of uh, of food directly in that sense in Asia and elsewhere, and so uh, you know, I would say a. Uh, uh, a vegetarian diet is certainly less demanding on the land 
than uh, uh, a diet involving a lot of meat. At the same time, I would say um, it's really high yields that are the best friend of nature. And if we have high yields, we can, I'd say we can, humanity can afford to produce meat, some meat for those who want it. But we may want to move in the direction of what I'll call a Mediterranean diet, where the, the main you're getting your calories mainly from from uh, spaghetti or potatoes or or uh, rice uh, or bread, and you're flavoring it with some sauce. And it may be a tomato sauce. It may be a tomato sauce with a bit of meat in it too, uh, some, or fish. So you're using the the wonderful flavors that uh, that many people enjoy. Uh, from from meats, but you're not using you're not you're not using the meat as the the main element of your diet. So so you know one doesn't have to go. Uh, I mean, for those who wish to be vegetarians or be even vegans, that's great. But uh, the scenario uh, that uh, we've written about is not one in which people have to uh, radically change their diet. We'd say it's a continuing evolution in the direction of. Uh, of poultry and also some of the successful aquaculture like oysters and uh, clams and mussels, uh, uh, and using those again for their uh, their their wonderful flavor in uh, in in sauces and toppings and uh, that way. But uh, you know, I think we'll keep it a hundred years from now. People may look back on America of the 1950s and you know a plate entirely covered by a big porterhouse steak or something like that. And they, they may say, well, that was a kind of a strange way to live. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it, it, uh, customs like this are always changing. So I, I th my guess is in the course of the 21st century, we'll move more in this direction of uh, a lighter diet in this sense. But it, but it can be one with enormous variety. You know, it's strange, and of, of course. course. There are other, uh, yeah, there are other forms uh, of flavoring that are very rich. Uh, you know, mushrooms, of course, give wonderful flavors to foods. And so, so you know, there, there, one can have a very, very, you know, the, uh, I don't want to make it sound like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to, to remember the 1960s and some of the initial American attempts at, uh, at vegetarian diets. You know, I went to Woodstock and ate brown rice and I, I'm, I'm not proposing, uh, that, that that become the norm. Uh, brown, of course, one can prepare brown rice very well, but the point is one one doesn't have to have, uh, one, one can have a diet that's, uh, very rich in, in variety and include, uh, 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 meats and all kinds of interesting, uh, uh, foods that without uh, without placing heavy demands on natural resources. It's ironic, though, because at, at the same time that vegetarianism, I think, has an increasing pull on a lot of people. Uh, we also have the, the paleo movement, which we've talked about here on the program in the past, which emphasizes uh, protein in particular. Uh, meat's very popular among uh, paleo diet folks. It'll be interesting to see how our knowledge of nutrition evolves. I, I don't know if it'll be a I think there's a lot of romance about how much uh, better that's going to get in the next 50 years. Maybe it will, uh, but I, I find it well, interesting meat, how little we know about what's good for us. Yeah, well, meat was important, is important, and meat was very important in the evolution of, I'll say, Homo sapiens and hominids. You know, if, if we were if we were living on grass, we'd have to have enormous long stomachs like cows uh, to, uh, you know, the ruminants to digest everything, and in considerable part, it was the shift to uh, to a carnivorous diet and certain kinds of cooking that, over thousands of years, enabled humanity to sort of change its shape and and uh, have the uh, the smaller, compact uh, digestive system that we do and the bigger brain. And the bigger brain, of course, allows us in turn to do a lot of things. So, so uh, you know, I think the 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 role of uh, of meat in in uh, human history is a very very important one, and you know uh, you know what we shouldn't we shouldn't forget it, and we shouldn't you know it's it's, it's uh, it is natural in that sense, and it's certainly part of part of uh, and very much part of our history. And yeah, some people still like those those porterhouse steaks, but uh, l let's turn to forestation. Uh, how much forest land there is uh, in the United States and in the world. Uh, you you talk about two uh, very important and and dramatic trends that many people may not be aware of. I wasn't for sure. I was only aware of one of them. But you, you point out there's been a move from north to south and from wild to managed, from from uh, 
a wild forest to a managed plant tree plantation. Uh, talk about the impact those two changes have in yields and the amount of land that's um, that's uh, forested. Well, naturally, uh, forests grow faster in uh, moister, warmer places. So in the United States, for example, if you're trying to grow a cord of wood in uh, Georgia or the southeastern United States, uh, that will happen faster and than in the Pacific Northwest or in a place like Minnesota or Northern Michigan. And over the last 50, 70 years or so, the U.S. wood products industry has moved to the Southeast where it is it is more productive and it's more productive, uh, again, per acre, per hectare, per, per square mile or per square kilometer. And so you need less land uh, to grow the same, the same board feet or, or uh, uh, whatever whatever measure of uh, wood products that uh, you care about so so the simply harvesting in the places where where it's naturally uh, faster growing is important but then of course we've also had uh, the the gradual but significant growth of uh, plantation forestry so oh in round numbers let's say 20% of of uh, forestry in the United States is now on lands that are really farmed for trees. And when you do that, you can introduce varieties that grow very quickly, uh, certain eucalypts, poplars, or some pines, and they may be on a rotation of, let's say, 15 or 20 years, whereas uh, trees in unmanaged forests may, be on, may take 50 or 60 or 100 years uh, to mature. So uh, one can... Uh, so the, wh- there are these uh, managed ways also of increasing yields, and all of this means that we can uh, get the same amount of uh, wood products or more uh, from uh, a smaller area of land that's that's logged. So now the result of this is an increase in in forested area and volume in the United States uh, in the last few decades. So. If you look at maps of America and how green it is, so to say, with forests, uh, you'll see both that there's more forest in America in 2015 than, let's say, in 1990 uh, or 1950. And you'll also see that the areas that have forest are actually denser with forest uh, than uh, uh, areas were uh, at that time. So the and that's, uh, that's because uh, of those are uh, not being used for, for timber and logging, correct? Well, there's there's the, they use more uh, efficiently? as an economist, one has to look both at supply and demand. Yep. Uh, We're what I've get just to said supply. talks about the, the, <laughs> the supply side, which right. is that the again the you know the weather is better and the and the the seedlings are better and you know they may be irrigated when they're young so that they don't uh, die off as often. So that's the supply side. You know what foresters and and modern forestry is doing, but then there's the demand side and. Uh, you know, the, the, there are a, a lot of uses of wood products that have just vanished, uh, destruction of demand. You know, when we were building railroads 100 years ago, we were cutting down lots of trees for the ties that held the railroads together. And when we started a telephone system all over the U.S., we, you know, we uh, chopped down lots of trees for telephone poles. Uh, now those niches don't exist. And, of course, most recently with uh, e-books and email, the demand for uh, for paper, for newsprint, or for uh, paper for first class letters and so forth, is it's collapsing. So you know the number of first class uh, letters in the U.S. dropped by about a quarter in five years recently, uh, and everybody knows this. If you look at your mailbox, there's just less stuff there. Uh, less, of course, people when you say mailbox now, they think of email. So I sometimes like to say, you know, Jeff Bezos of Amazon and Steve Jobs of Apple. You know they're really heroes of of the forests. We don't think of them that way, but the, the products they've introduced have lightened demand for traditional wood products. So, so a lot of wood for construction, uh, a lot of wood for pulp and paper. Uh, uh, the, the demand just isn't there anymore. So uh, uh, even if you're growing wood very efficiently, it's not necessarily a great business to be in. Uh, the demand so- the demand is soft, and in other parts of the world, uh, because they're leapfrogging in a sense, uh, you know, parts of Africa, let's say, or parts of South Asia, they won't ever 
have as many newsstands or as many magazines uh, 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 as America did. You know, now with with uh, smartphones and so forth, uh, uh, that you know, they, you know, it's even as India and China grow, they may use somewhat more paper, but they're not going to use paper the way Americans did in 1980 or 1950, and they're not going to use the wood the way people did in 19. 19- 20 to build railroads. So uh, the you know this change of the composition of the economy and the, the changes on the demand side, uh, the, the, the global result is that uh, uh, in the last since about 1990, worldwide forests are actually getting larger again, not getting smaller. There's more area of forest and more wood in the forest that exists. Now that's a global average. Some areas like parts of Indonesia. Uh, parts of Central Africa still have tragic situations with, uh, you know, with deforestation uh, for under occurring for a variety of reasons. But globally, uh, the picture is that uh, uh, forests uh, are increasing as they are in America. So I always tell my kids, well, we were in a, in a bathroom, public bathroom, and there's a an air dry uh, device that says uh, we you know save trees use this or we save all these trees because we have these electric hand dryers instead of the paper towels and i always say you know if you want to increase the number of trees you should be tearing off those paper towels like crazy and uh, making sure you use a bunch of them because that's going to increase the demand for 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 paper which in turn will encourage the growth of trees now that's true in tree plantations uh Obviously, there's a tension, and we'll get to it more deeply when we talk about uh, uh, oceans and fisheries because of the, pro- the tragedy of the commons, the problem of the common property that's unowned. Forests that are unowned are going to get harvested um, ineff- inefficiently because the incentives are there not to take care of them. Forests that are owned, plantations that we've been talking about, in those cases, uh, you're going to want to grow more trees when you people use more paper. What I'm curious about, what I don't know about, uh, you point out that that only about twenty percent of of u s uh logging is done on tree farms if there were an expansion of demand for paper or better yet a contraction let 's talk about a contraction because that seems to be the trend because of the forces you were talking about. If everybody stopped using paper towels, everybody stopped using regular mail uh no houses were built out of wood, furniture and decks were built out of plastic and as a result, uh, the uh, use of the demand for paper plummeted, but not to zero. Would that reduce logging in in public lands uh, that are essentially unowned and managed in complicated ways through politics or worse through uh, harvesting at first come, first serve? Or would that be a, a contraction in tree farming? Do you have any idea? It's a hard question. Well, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, that's not really my expertise. My expertise is more on the technical and ecological end, and you're asking questions that are really more economics and behavioral. So, you know, I, I'd say as a citizen, I could make a comment, but I, but it's not really expert. What, 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 what I would say is that, you know, I think the, uh, there will be continuing soft demand for a lot of natural resource products. We've gone through a period in which uh, the prices for a lot of natural resources were were quite high, including petroleum, but uh, uh, wood products and others. But uh, if you look around the world and you look at the, the this incredible apparatus of innovation in uh, engineering and science uh, in all sectors of life, you begin to see that efficiency really is winning. It's in it's in many cases it's gradual but it's very powerful and so uh this leads to a kind of uh, dematerialization you know we we need less stuff to accomplish uh the services to provide the services or features that we uh needed before so uh i don't think we'll go i don't think we'll stop using wood uh, but we may use wood only for its aesthetic qualities, so it's uh, you know it's like as for veneers and so forth. Or so, uh, but you know we 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 may not use it in these uh, uh, sort of bulk ways. Well, I, I, uh, want, I want to I, I want to turn to dematerialization, but uh, before I do, let me just ask one clarifying question about about trees. Is um, 
You said tree plantations provide about 20 percent of the current uh, output of, of wood. I assume that's up over recent decades. Yes, yes. That percentage. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, silviculture is, uh, is uh, growing gradually in the U.S. and in uh, Brazil and in Chile and uh, New Zealand and various other countries. Uh, uh, so, the, the, yeah, the answer to that is yes. Now, you know, you've raised complex questions about ownership. And, of course, what would be the, let's say, the optimal wood products industry? Maybe it would be an industry in which half of the wood came from, from, I'll say, plantations, from from heavily managed uh, forests, and maybe half from much less managed forests. Uh, There are reasons to thin and cull uh, the, the less managed forests to reduce risks of forest fires to uh, allow new growth to maintain habitat for certain kinds of uh, birds or other animals so uh, you know the 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 uh, you know let me say the optimal wood products industry might not be completely concentrated in silviculture it might well be uh, a mix of the two but i think most people would expect the the silviculture the plantation forests uh, in the US and the rest of the world to continue to grow and again those you know they can uh, they can produce uh, two three four times the yield per hectare that the that the the wild forests do so uh, we so can again, think about just you need to disturb less land the, the i'm moving in the direction of a bigger argument which is in in the uh, in nature rebounds the 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 uh, the, uh, the the report that you mentioned which is that uh, actually that the, the the continents are actually getting greener, not browner. Uh, the uh, you know, we tend to if if you ask somebody what's happened to to Earth, you know, since the astronauts first uh, looked at it from space, at least looked at the continents, most people would say, oh well, they used to, you know Earth used to be the planet that uh, the, the continents used to be really green, and now you know we're there's desertification and deforestation and you We've know we're, cities habitat. are growing. Yeah. Yeah, everything. So it's getting browner, not greener. But much to our surprise, over the last 20, 25 years, uh, a growing group of us are convinced and publishing papers about a phenomenon we're calling global greening. That on on land, in fact, the because of this, in part because of this changing demand for wood products, for example, because of rising yields, uh, but also because of changing global ecology. Uh, the the, the uh, continents are getting greener, and when I say changing global ecology, there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that's a you know that's carbon dioxide is is food for plants. It's you know it, it may change the climate, but it's also uh, uh, you know the the plants like to uh, to suck it in. It helps them grow. So the rising CO2, the the in there, these somewhat longer growing seasons in the northern hemisphere uh, associated with uh, with warming. There's more nitrogen around. Uh, so these these top down reasons, uh, uh, some areas are actually getting more rainfall, including uh, sub-Saharan Africa, the Sahel, an area which uh, you know had been very very dry for a long time. So so the combination of these sort of top down changes of the uh, the CO2 increasing, the longer growing seasons, uh, and the bottom up changes like people switching to uh, to email and farmers getting. Uh, smarter at, uh, at growing corn, uh, have actually led over the last uh, 25 years to increases in what's called annual gross productivity. Uh, and uh, the biosphere actually seems to be getting bigger by about a billion tons a year, maybe even two billion tons a year globally. Now, again, that's a global average, and there are some areas, uh, some parts of the world, uh, the southern Amazon, parts of Indonesia, uh, uh, where you know heartbreaking changes are still occurring to to the landscape, but if you look globally, uh, then uh, this global greening seems to uh, uh, to be happening, and it's uh, really a surprise. None of the uh, you know if you look back at reports from 1980, 1990, none of them predicted this would happen. Everybody you know, was living life on the tangent, so to say, and uh, just expecting that the the trends that we were feeling in those years of uh, deforestation and the uh, you know just ever heavier use of resources would uh, continue. But, 
And we're going to close, and in, 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 at the end, I want to talk about rewilding. It's a fascinating thing. But what we're really talking about here is the rewilding of land, not with wildlife, but with trees. So as you said, when, when less land is used for agriculture, a whole bunch of things replace it. Uh, it could be a, a, a savanna. It could be a natural growing, the expansion of forests that are now, that weren't allowed to encroach on that farmland. But what's amazing is that because of the demand changes you're talking about and for, for wood and because of the supply changes on the plantation side, those expanding forest areas are going to be available for recreation, human enjoyment, or just natural beauty in uh, ways that, that couldn't be imagined. And, and as you said, the trends all look very depressing. But uh, I think most people think that there are fewer trees in the United States than there were 100 years ago. One thing they forget, of course, is we don't chop them down for fuel anymore. That's, enough, that's a, an enormous change in demand that has taken place. But over these, all these trends working together are very powerful. <laughs> that's exactly right. And, and uh, it's a kind of confluence of these, of these trends. And, uh, you know, again, I think very few people really anticipated it. And, and the, the, I'll say the trees come first, you know, or the, you know, maybe some bushes and then some trees, but uh, animals follow wildlife. And of course, you know, we're, we're used to the idea that there are lots of deer around again and wild turkeys. And uh, now they're starting to be, uh, you know, bobcats and uh, mountain lions and uh, uh, New Jersey has a huge bear population. New Jersey has something like 2,500 bears, and in the last uh, half dozen years or so, each autumn, New Jersey now has a bear hunt in which, in a few weeks, uh, four or five hundred bears are uh, are uh, called by hunters. So you know, we you know, if you think most people think of New Jersey. Uh, they asphalt. don't think of it's bears. As, it's all asphalt. It's all just <laughs> it's all paved over New Jersey. I've been there. <laughs> so so no, the, the things are are you know there there things really are changing in in ways uh, that uh, we had not fully anticipated. We will we'll, we'll never fully anticipate everything, of course. But there are some some surprises now. How far all of this will go, of course, is a big question. You know, we, we don't will it, uh, and how will we adapt ourselves to some of these changes? Will you know, do we really want to live again with uh, with uh, lots of beer, uh, deer, uh, deer, and or the Lyme disease that may come with them, or or uh, the way uh, they eat our gardens, all the bears? <laughs> yeah, I, I so, live, so I we, we need to learn to live with wildlife again. I live in suburban Maryland. Um, uh, I see a dead deer a week in the road, uh, maybe more. And uh, they, in certain parts of of suburban Maryland, outside suburban Maryland, outside Washington D.C. Uh, people can't have gardens because the deer eat them all. I remember visiting friends in in Silver Spring and seeing deer on someone's lawn, and I was just I said that's very beautiful. And they said we don't think so. They're <laughs> they see them as vermin uh, because they eat everything. Uh, so that's yeah. The, the coexistence part is going to be uh, a fascinating uh, evolution. On the negative side, uh, you point to what's happening in the world's oceans. There, the trends are not so good, and we reached recently. I recently interviewed Roger Berkowitz, who's the CEO of Legal Seafoods, and we talked about some of the sustainability issues. Uh, talk about what's happening in the oceans. The oceans are 100 years behind the land, uh, and we need to do more to uh, protect and conserve ocean life, uh, to uh, protect ocean habitat. Uh, partly, of course, it has to do with uh, economic and legal and social issues, even in even nations that have on paper good governance of their waters usually don't have sufficient uh, coast guard and navy and so forth to enforce compliance with what may be good on paper but there's still a lot of renegade behavior or piracy or whatever you want to call it even in the exclusive economic zones of countries and of course on the high seas uh, the situation is uh, even more chaotic and the productivity of the oceans, I'll say the natural productivity of the oceans, one, one might say is at a plateau, while seafood uh, tastes too good for its own safety. <laughs> I like to say the democratization of sushi is the greatest problem of the oceans. When only the emperor of Japan ate sushi, it wasn't a big problem. But now a billion people want to eat sushi. And with uh, good refrigeration and high-speed transport, it's possible to have you know this Seafood is fantastic when it's been, when it's fresh, when it's been properly chilled, so forth. And 
the uh, you know there just isn't enough of the I'll say natural the wild uh, sea life to to go around for for so many so many chopsticks and so we need to succeed in the oceans with aquaculture the way we've succeeded on land if we want meat from the seas the way to do that of course is with herbivores the you you want you you want uh, the plants like uh, animals like the, the clams and oysters and so forth that are filter feeders uh, that feed on the meadows of the ocean, so to say, uh, and uh, fish like catfish or, or tilapia uh, that eat uh, tofu. Well, a problem is that some of the popular, some of the most popular ocean meats like tuna and salmon, uh, those animals are carnivores, and so we catch anchovies or herring or. Uh, menhaden and grind them up and and feed those to the salmon and that doesn't in the fish farms. create an, in the fish yeah and that doesn't create a net benefit so we need to teach the uh, the salmon to eat tofu which can be done there, there are some examples already of success uh, mentioned in in my report uh, where some of the the popular forms of uh, of ocean meat where the animals uh, uh, are carnivores where they've been uh, 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 trained, uh, educated uh, to be also to be vegetarian. <laughs> you just have to put them in, the, make put the tofu in the shape of a herring. I mean, it's it works as a fish. Well, you need lure. to make it taste good. <laughs> you know, it's a bit like if if you have a dog or a cat. You know, the uh, of course, you know, the dog may love to tear into a piece of meat, but if you if you uh, you know if you if you put a little juice from a steak on top of a let's I'll say some tofu. Uh, this the, the dog will scarf it right up. So it's a bit That's like what I was saying at the beginning That's very about cruel, the, uh, the Mediterranean <laughs> diet. Well, they're Something happy. It's the, okay. it's really the flavor they want, you know. And we're the same. So uh, and they're getting they're getting nutrition from the uh, so so yeah. So the oceans, uh, you know, really are still uh, losing life in many areas, uh, net net losses, and you know, as more and more people have uh, higher incomes and the ability to access, you know, this incredibly delicious uh, uh, sea life, you know, I think it's, you know, one of the really, really big challenges over the next, let's say, well, right from now, but uh, over the next generation is to uh, change, treat, treat life in the oceans with more respect and Make sure that the that life from the oceans that humans eat is uh, is uh, I'll say farmed or raised in uh, in ways that's uh, that allows the uh, wild populations to continue. Oh. And again, it may be that we have we continue to eat small amounts of the wild populations in a kind of artisanal way, you know, supplying great flavor. But you know, we, we can't just go go around uh, sieving the ocean for all all its wildlife. Yeah, one way to do that we talked about with uh, Roger Berkowitz is there are organizations that try to discourage people from eating certain types of seafood that they worry are not sustainable or in danger their stocks are you know artificially low and of course at the same time as you mentioned there's a governance issue when there's fishing seasons and harvest quotas to try to maintain uh, the size of of a fishery it's they may not be set correctly they may not be enforced correctly but Obviously, agriculture as a way to drive the price down, aquaculture, uh, mariculture, those as a way to drive the price down can dominate both of the, you know, the cultural influence or the governance change. What I find interesting, uh, and I first noticed this maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, there was an article I read that you know, they, were, they were farming tuna. Most people, when they think about a fish farm, they think about a trout or they might think about salmon, but tuna were being in a very large enclosure in the ocean were being uh, farmed. That is, they were allowed to run around. It's, it, they were, it's not free-range tuna, but it's closer to free-range tuna than what we think of as a cement pond sitting somewhere and uh, wherever you would do it for tuna, maybe you can't even do it. But the question I have is that a lot of environmentalists uh, oppose, even even though they have the same goal as as you might have of encouraging the health of the fisheries, they oppose fish farming as as unhealthy for the environment. What are your thoughts on that? It has to be done well. You know, almost any industry you can think of, whether it's tanneries or chip fabrication or salmon farming, if you visit uh, ten companies or uh, ten 
plants. Uh, they won't all be equally good in terms of occupational safety and health, in terms of uh, emissions of air and water, uh, in terms of uh, productivity. And uh, I've, I've visited a fair number of salmon farms, and I've visited some in which the farmers are extremely careful about management of wastes, extremely careful about uh, defending against possible escapes, extremely careful about use and, and frugal about use of antibiotics. And I've seen others uh, that uh, that make me feel ashamed. And so, you know, I think the, the one has to try to promulgate the best practices. Uh, but I think the, in the long run, uh, as you were suggesting for, for sea life, we need to address both the supply and the demand. So we need to help educate people about what are, let's say more responsible things to eat. Uh, but we also have to provide, uh, economical substitutes that, uh, that will, that may replace some of uh, what's what's currently desirable. So, you know, I think simply reprimanding uh, is unlikely to, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. It can be, it you know, can be the drug problem. You know, it's, uh, just say no is not enough, so to say. Yeah. You, you know, you have to, you always have to address both supply and demand. And so I think in, in the oceans, we need to think about how, and, and aquaculture globally is succeeding. And of course, uh, it, it's an ancient uh, uh form of farming, you know, the, the Chinese have grown carp for a long time and, you know, the, uh, uh, pike and, you know, a lot of freshwater, there's a lot of freshwater aquaculture and, you know, the things that we think of things like uh, gefilte fish, you know, which is a, a popular delicacy in, in uh, Eastern and Central Europe and places like New York. Uh, you know, these, it's basically, uh, ground up carp or pike made into dumplings. Uh, and a lot of that, can, has been done for a long time through uh, through aquaculture. So one can make wonderful, delicious products, and and uh, the the uh, I'll say the ranchers can operate uh, uh, very well. But obviously, one needs regulation. One uh, you know one needs uh, uh, people who go around and check and make sure uh, there is. A, there's also a lot of uh, fraud, of course, uh, with uh, product packaging. Uh, particularly of, of uh, sea life, but uh, other things as well, where uh, you know what, what consumers think they're buying is not actually what they're buying. So, you know, I think there's a lot of room for imp improvement, uh, and a lot of this is, again is high tech. One can use uh, DNA for identification of products to make sure that what you think you're buying is really what you're buying. One can use uh, uh, a chain of custody to make sure that the products are coming. Uh, you know. You know, at each stage, you know, it's it's like what Federal Express or United Parcel Service does. You know, you can know where your <laughs> where a package was at every stage. So, you know, I think there are there are ways going forward involving better operations, better analytics, better research that would allow consumers to uh, to be confident that uh, they're buying uh, products that are responsibly produced. I just want to say that I think this is it's certainly the first time on Econ Talk. It may be the first time ever that I have heard uh, gefilte fish referred to as a delicacy. I appreciate that um, that tip of the hat, I, and I can't help but have the image of my great-grandmother's carp in her um, bathtub, which was a, a very primitive form of fish farming <laughs> for urban uh, dwellers who would after well, being— Well, she, she was a green. You have yeah, to, exactly. You have to, you have to, you have to see you have, you have a, an antecedent, a very honorable antecedent. Yeah. Um, We've talked a lot. Uh, I'm going to shift gears here, uh, and we're going to come. We're going to shift gears for a minute, and then we'll come back to uh, wildlife as our close. But um, we've talked a lot on this program about the potential for driverless cars and uh, drones, uh, driverless taxis, uh, Uber without any human drivers, which I think is inevitable without regulation that stops it. And I think that would mainly be a very good thing for the world. Although it will be challenging for truck drivers uh, and cab drivers who may have trouble finding new things to do for a while. So I understand it's a complicated situation overall, but certainly the the kind of effects you're talking about here, and you, you allude to them and you're, you talk about them explicitly. You don't allude to them. You talk about them explicitly in your essay. Uh, talk about uh, what's happening in transportation and why it too is uh, having a, a greening effect. Well, drones are absolutely key. Uh 
when I, uh, there's a new essay that came out in June by a terrific professor at Purdue in the magazine Foreign Affairs uh, about farming without farmers. And, uh, you know, we can have sailing without sailors. We can have uh, uh, aircraft without pilots now and people operating uh, remotely with a, a joystick, so to say. Uh, and, of course, the area in which the most dramatic change could occur is uh, – is driving. You know, there are school bus drivers and there are taxi drivers. Uh, uh, the average car, though, is only used about an the average motor vehicle in America and around the world is only used about an hour a day. A taxi may be used, let's say, 12 hours a day. Uh, cars, uh, some of the cars that are in the car sharing companies are used, let's say, eight hours a day. Well, if these became autonomous vehicles with, you know, good uh, GPS systems, uh, you know, in effect, in effect, robot taxis that you could call with an app, a bit like an Uber or Lyft. Suppose they were just used two or three or four hours a day, not eight or 12 hours a day, but more than the one hour a day that vehicles are now being used. Well, we would need many, many fewer motor vehicles. Also, Garages, they would use roads. The, everything could the, be better. The, 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 con congestion would be less of a problem. Yeah, road use would be lower, uh, you know, the, so that the wear and tear on roads would be lower. The... Uh, uh, and uh, th that people would be lost less, uh, so you'd actually save miles that way. And the vehicles themselves, of course, we're seeing this shift after a hundred years. Uh, basically, you know, basically we're driving the same car that uh, Henry Ford talked about until very recently. But now we're seeing this great, great ferment in the automotive world with uh, fuel cells, uh, hydrogen electric cars. Fuel cells, in a sense, are electric cars battery-powered electric cars, compressed natural gas to power cars. And even the old internal combustion engine, let's say Henry Ford's engine, is fighting back, and there are new versions of it that are getting 60, 70, 75 miles a gallon. So all of these can increase the uh, efficiency of the transport system, uh, again, by big numbers. I mean, it won't happen, it won't double overnight, but over a period of decades, it can be two or three times as efficient. <laughs> and... That means we don't need as much input. We don't need as much petroleum uh, in the case of the, the dominant fuel now. And if you look around the world, you actually see that petroleum demand in the U.S. and Japan and Korea and many, many countries has been flat for quite a long time now. Partly it may be economic recession, but partly I think it is also these these changes starting to nibble away the more efficient vehicles, changes in driving habits, uh, the, uh, uh, these changes that uh, that uh, also are lightening demand on the natural resources. So uh, again, I think uh, contrary to uh, to the expectations that I grew up with, and which attracted me into a career in environmental science and technology. You know, I, again, I come back to this sort of idea of global greening and nature rebounding. The, the transport system, which uh, along with agriculture, you know, was so much the transformer of, uh, of Earth in the last hundred years, that system may also finally be moving in this lighter, less material direction where, you know, again, a system – and you know, if, if, if India doesn't reproduce the American system of the 1950s, but I'll say leapfrogs to a kind of uh, uh, autonomous Uber-like system – uh, in which, you know, you have lots of taxis zinging around, uh, you know, it, it won't need the, the, the glass or the rubber, uh, or the oil that, uh, the American system of motorization needed. So, so it's not only that America can get more efficient, but for China and India and, the, you know, their decisions are so fateful, uh, the, the, you know, you, the, you know, we may really be starting to glimpse this a change. And the, you know, the 21st century, the 20th century, may be looked back upon. Again, it's like the porterhouse steak. It may really be looked upon as this back upon as this kind of period in which we humanity did sort of gulp. Uh, but the 21st century, you know, you, you look at your uh, at your smartphone, and that replaces a boombox and a and an alarm clock and a and a camera and uh, a half a dozen other uh, devices of plastic and metal that you used to have. And so, you know, we may actually be entering into a period in which 
information, uh, and I'll say capital, uh, are extremely important. Those are the really important resources, and the natural resources, water, energy, land, materials, and as you said, labor, are spared. So you know, what people will do, of course, is a wide open question, which you should ask your next guest, not yeah, me. Well, but We've talked about but that. But I think the, <laughs> from the environmental point of view, the good news is we're starting to see the return of forests. We're starting to see uh, slackening demand for a lot of the uh, natural resources. Water use in America actually now is lower, is, is, the, is as low as it was is in the 1960s. It's we've you know again you think with the California drought and everything people would, American water withdrawals have gone up but actually they've been falling because farmers are using water more efficiently power plants are using water more efficiently so uh, again we we've tended to be preoccupied and impressed by the incredible technological advances I'll say of the the smartphone and the internet but really meanwhile uh, the farmers and the water engineers and and the people in transport, you know, everybody else is doing neat stuff too. And if you start to put it together, you get a, uh, a, a you know, a, a rather different picture, which is we may be, you know, things may be tilting in the direction which many people hoped they would. Well, uh, you know, that, let, that's, let's, well, let's, we only got a few minutes and I want to make sure we get to the, uh, a caveat uh, that you might want to add or maybe not. And I, I want to say in advance that, uh, I often make fun of romance, uh, but deep down, I think all human beings are romantic about nature in some sense. There's some deep primal part of us that connects to it. Some of us may connect to it more aesthetically than others. Uh, but you, I'm going to read a quote of uh, slightly uh, edited. I haven't changed any of the words, but uh, that you close with, and then I want to raise the caveat. You say, so why do we want nature to rebound? Because the incipient rewilding of Europe and the United States is thrilling. Salmon have returned to the Seine and Rhine, lynx to several countries, and wolves to Italy. Reindeer herds have rebounded in Scandinavia and Eastern Europe. Bison have multiplied in Poland. The image of a humpback whale in, uh, with the Empire State Building in the background was the most significant envir environmental image of 2014. Whether into the woods or sea, the way is clear, the light is good, and the time is now. A large, prosperous, innovative humanity producing and consuming wisely might share the planet with many more companions – as nature rebounds, and of course, that's the end of the quote, but of course, there are people talking about returning mastodons uh, and other uh, life forms that we've uh, pushed out through our humanity. And so it's an incredible time. Your essay captures that with incredible richness. I encourage everyone to look at it. We'll put a link up to it. But it leaves out the question that I think many listeners will have, which is, does anything worry you? It's awfully cheerful. Uh, you've said nothing about global warming except as a positive uh, impact on vegetation. A lot of people think it's a potential catastrophe. Why have uh, why are you silent on that, or what, are you not worried about it, or do you think it's overblown? Well, I've worked a lot on that issue and written a lot about it, uh, and so I, I didn't want to spend a lot of time in this essay on it. You know, at first, I think that the the emissions the uh, the emissions that might uh, affect uh, the climate. Uh, are moderating. And in fact, U.S. emissions have probably peaked. European emissions have probably peaked. And I think that the, you know, the Chinese and Indian emissions will also peak in another 10, 20 years. So, you know, I think there are things will, I think things will go up, but if you, uh, a lot of this, the very frightening scenarios involve concentrations in the atmosphere going up to say, double pre-industrial level, 600 parts per million, or even 900 parts per million, triple. Uh, and my own estimates, I, I've played in this game as well as, you know, as many people have, I, I think we'll go to from the present 400 parts per million to, let's say, 450, 500. I think we'll probably plateau there if my scenario in general is right about efficiency winning in a lot of domains of life and so forth. So, uh, you know, it's something to keep an eye on. Uh, and obviously, water management will be extremely important. Uh, at the same time, if we're more efficient, for example, with water management, then uh, you know, as water shifts a bit around the world, the uh, the consequences of some some shifts will be less less catastrophic. So, uh, you know, I think it's something you know, it's something to be you know uh, to monitor very carefully. Uh, uh, I, I don't, but I think basically this. The, the path of 
of increasingly efficient use of water, energy, land, and materials is the right way to go, and that will that that will that lessens worries about uh, climate change. Now that leaves wide open whether climate change is a dial or a switch. You know, if it's a dial so that New York ends up with the climate of Philadelphia and Philadelphia ends up with the climate of Baltimore, no one's really in the end going to care a lot. On the other hand, if it's not a dial like that, but if you know, New York ends up with the climate of Galveston, then obviously that's a lot more to worry about. I don't think we know. I don't think the, you know, I just don't think we know. So, uh, you know, there are some things that are unknown and there are some that are unknowable. And I think that has to be in the latter. Uh, and similarly. What, what, what does, but do, there are some things that worry me. One is this question of employment. What will people do? Because I think the sparing of natural resources, the drones, all of this goes hand in hand with sparing of labor. And, uh, you know, farming without farmers can be wonderful in many ways, uh, but it also, you know, and, you know, taxis without taxi drivers, uh, you know, may have many benefits. And, you know, a lot of people will say they'll be safer, actually. But, but you know, the, the question of what people will do, will there be enough jobs and in information handling, uh, you know, to, to keep people, people's social status as well as their income and uh you know, that's a very, very big question. Another thing that I that I wonder a lot about is human performance enhancement. There are a whole yeah. set of technologies that that you know that you know I don't think you can only get better at semiconductors and not get better at a bunch of other things. And you know, we saw Lance Armstrong, and you know, they work. And there are more and more forms of these things. Those will become stronger and stronger. And so, you know, I I worry about. Uh, you know, what people will be like in another uh, 25 or, or 50 years. Uh, and uh, a question I like to ask, you know, who is the real me? I think that's changing. And uh, so so I think there's plenty to worry about, but I wasn't asked to write about that or to speak about that in the essay that, uh, that you're referring to. I was asked yeah. to talk about what I think is happening to nature. And I think... Uh, Again, I think the 21st century is starting off with some very promising indications that uh, nature may rebound. My guest today has been Jesse Osabel. Jesse, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Russ, thanks very much. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.